All right. So, um, welcome. March 28th, 2023. I am just about to put something in the um, in the chat, which is about um, a documentary I watched uh, uh, last night. This was kind of how I ended my, <laughs> I just did like a week long home retreat and uh, watch this video about the founding of uh, Insight Meditation Society, which is our, you know, kind of fl flagship Dharma Center, uh, the first big uh, Western, Western formed, you know, what formed by Westerners back in the 70s. And uh, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Cornfield, Sharon Salzberg, and, and Jacqueline Schwartz, uh, Mandel, Nay, Schwartz uh, were the founding teachers, and uh, it's a little tricky to watch it. Like they, you have to sign up for some email list or something, but it, it was worth it. Really, really interesting. Uh, a bunch of people you might recognize who were who were around in those days, and there's some amazing photographs uh, you know, that uh, from early on, but. Uh, you know, I, I did the three month retreat there in 1981, which was just kind of, you know, five years into it. So it was a little different then, but they were still kind of in a, a very fluid kind of period before it, it settled down into a more systematic and structured way of operating. In fact, the year I was there was uh, <laughs> not surprisingly somehow with my karma was kind of crazy. And uh, and I think it spurred them to get more uh, uh, like oh. systematic or something about how they approached the retreats. They had some visiting teachers who kind of um, stirred things up, <laughs> shall we say? And uh, of course, I was not sober, so uh, my own energy was uh, not. I don't know how helpful that was for the group. <laughs> A hundred people, but the surprisingly, one of the teachers that year was um, John Orr, and I ran into him at Southern Dharma last year, and he walked up to me and says, "Oh, Kevin, it's so good to see you. I remember you from the 1981 retreat." I was like, "What? You remember?" There were a hundred people there, so I, I was assuming nobody, none of the teachers remembered me, and it, it kind of scared me, and I, I never. And not scared me, frightened, really frightened me, but it made me wonder why he remembered me. And uh, and I didn't ask him. So now I, I feel like I want to ask him, why would he remember me out of 100 people? And I, I'm not sure I want to know the answer, but anyway. So uh, it's we should be getting on to meditation. Um, as I said, I just finished a uh, self-retreat at home and which I think I'll talk about a bit after we sit. Um, I don't have any any teachings prepared, and I, and I thought that I was probably going to do more of a uh, open question session today. Um, uh, my my mind isn't uh, in a really like <laughs> square place to like deliver anything. Um, so uh, and, and I thought. I would just talk about how I organize my self retreats and just put out the idea that, you know, maybe people are interested in doing that for themselves. And I could, you know, I don't know, this is a thought that I could sort of consult with individuals about how they would like to do a self retreat if they're interested. Anyway, that can all come later. I assume everyone is muted since we had some conversations and, uh, so I'm going to just mute everybody with the powers that are entrusted to me as the host of this meeting. Um, and I will, I will do my best uh, to guide the meditation. For, on Friday night, I, I, I taught like sort of the like class. I was here in body, uh, but I found it very difficult because I was in the midst of this retreat and I, I still showed up. I, I might have been wise to let someone else cover it, but... Um, I had a really hard time guiding the meditation, but maybe now that I'm kind of breaking out of the retreat, I'll, I'll be more successful.
if you know if i'm not making sense just you know put put me on mute and uh and we'll uh and you can just practice on your own all right settling back into a comfortable upright posture if you are if you are comfortable upright if you are not comfortable upright you can also meditate lying down particularly since we're on zoom so won't disturb anyone and if you have your uh, camera off nobody will even know of course the risk of lying down is that we fall asleep so just make note of that keep the eyes open if you're lying first thing is to try to come into a stillness so just take a moment and just try to make the body completely still When you do that, of course, you'll see that because of the movement of breath, that you can't be completely still. Instead, you can experience a kind of contrast between the, the stillness and the movement. perhaps more significant is to notice any resistance to stillness or perhaps just energy there that's still moving or kind of burning inside. One of the things we encounter in meditation is our inner agitation or stress, whatever you call it. It's the kind of energy that keeps us moving in our lives, literally keeps us active and not in a good way. From the traditional Buddhist perspective, we would call this restlessness. It is the underlying energy that we see all around us, we feel inside us. Restlessness might be the reason there's more traffic on the weekends when people aren't working and don't have to go anywhere than there is during the week. It's hard for us to be still. And so this practice asks us to not move, to not run, to turn toward and be with those feelings. And here is where we bring in the breath. The breath is the soother 
of restlessness. The container for restlessness. The Buddha called mindfulness of breathing an ambrosial, pleasant dwelling. Ambrosia, the food of the gods. Restlessness stirs not only the body, but the mind. So in our mindfulness practice, we become aware of the excursions of thought. just like the excursions of body. They're off and rambling. Often with no real destination in mind. Rather, it is the discomfort with stillness and emptiness, that the restlessness of mind is responding to, trying to fill that space to avoid the implications of emptiness of stillness. Bring us back from these movements of mind and restlessness of body. We use the breath, the body, sensations, we use sound. So we start with the sense experience that is always tied to the present moment, only experienced in the present moment.
the Buddha offers various reflections meant to help us to be present and to see the truth. Realizing that all your experience is contained in the six senses and the six objects of those senses. There is only seeing and the seen feeling and the felt, hearing and the heard, tasting, smelling, the objects of taste and smell. And thinking and the objects of thinking or mind and the objects of mind. This is all that there is in your experience, despite the illusion of something more a past and a future, a self, a permanence. All just creations of mind.
All right. Um, and thank you for dropping in. <laughs> A little bit of that. Uh, what's his name? <laughs> okay. Not that I'm spaced out or anything. That's not possible. Um, uh, but uh, I, I wanted to put a little, put the uh, course that I'm starting next week. I, I sent out an email, probably a lot of you guys got this email uh, about the uh, Four Noble Truths of Recovery I'm doing for Buddhist Center, for Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, um, starting next week. And um, yeah, I, I kind of stumbled into talking about restlessness there. And um, so I think I might just take that up uh, as a bit of a topic today. Um, you know, when, when you sit, you know, um, a lot, you know, as Joe was just got off a retreat of a month and um, I just had a few days, but it's the experience of just like repeatedly sitting down to meditate um, in, the, in, a, in a day, you know. So I was trying to do five hours of sitting each day. Um, you know, what it is that makes it difficult is, is always an interesting question to ask yourself. Like what, what is, um, what's going on, you know, that, that first of all, that my mind isn't settling and, and what's going on then in my body. And, 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 you know, I think that my practice is, I'm sort of more interested in my body experience in my practice than, than in my mind, which I don't know if that's a good thing or not, good, bad, whatever, just sort of where, where I orient. <laughs> and what I generally find is that there's a, a sensation, I was going to say a knot of tension, but it's not, a, it doesn't feel like a knot to me. It feels a little bit more like a, a slight burning, like a slight flame but it's just a it's a sensation that's that i find in the middle of the chest around the solar plexus generally and there can be there can be lots of other things going on but that's when i'm trying to like get to a place of calm and you know and we have formal terms for this in, in buddhism samatha which is tranquility and then deeper than samatha is samadhi, which is more of a really stable mind state and, and I would say body state. When I'm trying to get there, which obviously when you're meditating five hours a day or eight hours a day or how many hours you're doing on a retreat, you are trying to get there. <laughs> By definition, you wouldn't be doing this if you weren't trying to get some tranquility and and concentration and and it's it's wise to not have that be your sole purpose because that's not an that's not the end uh, purpose of buddhist meditation but but when we sit down and sit like that that discomfort feels like it has to be addressed before anything else is going to really be productive. And, uh, and what, you know, when we talk about productive in Buddhism, we're talking about insight, right? Seeing impermanence, seeing suffering, seeing the corelessness or self, not self nature of experience and all that goes around all that, you know, all the, all the insights that can, uh, in the kind of galaxy of insights around that, those core insights. But to get there, you know, I, th I think it's generally understood that you need to get the 
uh, at least the level of samatha, if not samadhi, to get to a place of tranquility. And as I say, my experience of that is that there's very often, it, it you know, a core agitation, a core disturbance. And, and I experience this typically in my daily practice. I don't know what you guys experience. And, um, and I don't like it. <laughs> and it's frustrating because especially because you can be sitting and like, I'm paying attention to my breath, but there's still this thing in there, this thing that's like, eh. <laughs> And so there's a version to it, right? A version, not, uh, is a, I think I talked about this the other day, that this word aversion is a strange word that we don't use that much in our normal speech, but it it's not two words, not a version of something, version 2.0. It's being averse, which means not liking it. And it's a good word because it really captures when you're averse, you're like, ugh, I just, ugh, no, I want, I want that to go away. But there's this, this feeling that I would identify as restlessness. And, and then you pile on to that, your aversion to it, right? Because there's also this striving <laughs> for the pleasant which is the desire. So now you have three of the five hindrances operating here. And I'll say that what often happens is that what, early in the stages of this, like in your daily practice or early in a retreat or really at any time on a retreat, is that when you do start to quiet that restlessness, it tips right over into sleepiness because there's this other element that needs to be there, which is energy. And restlessness is very energetic. So it's like, well, that should work. But the trouble is that restlessness is not a spiritual energy. The, the term in Pali is virya. Restlessness is a disturbed energy. It's a um, an uncomfortable energy. And so you have to develop this other kind of energy, which, how do you do that? You know, I, I cannot tell you how to do that other than you just got to keep sitting. And this is why longer retreats are so valuable because you start to see this process unfolding and how just by staying with the very simple instruction and the simpler, the better in my mind, the simpler you can, keep your practice, the better, that this whole tangle of hindrances and kind of conflicting mental and physical elements that seem unresolvable because we are powerless over them in the 12-step language, right? You can't really push the restlessness away and you can't really arouse viria and you can't really push the sleepiness away, you, you know, you can kind of like dance a little bit around them and sort of glide and kind of lean a little bit here and there, but you can't control them. But this is why mindfulness is, is at the heart of this whole process, because mindfulness has this superpower, you know, that it actually resolves all this stuff. It's really amazing. And, you know, again, for people who've been on retreats, and I know many of you have sat through this experience, it's really quite remarkable that it's like, I can't, I'm not able to handle, I can't do this, I can't control this, I can't make this happen. But damn it, I'm just going to keep sitting here, you know, because you have to have that determination, you have to be willing to keep sitting here. And, and coming back and just doing this simple practice and it's so frustrating. You're like, I hate this. You know, I just want to go back to bed. I want to go home. I want to just, you know, give me a, somebody give me a cheeseburger, you know, something. But 
you know, when you don't give in to all those impulses, and, you, and this is why you go on a retreat, right? So you're in this container that there, there are no cheeseburgers and there is no Netflix. It's like, there's nothing else to do, but okay, just keep going. What am I, I'm walking, I'm just feeling my feet. The superpower of mindfulness is that it balances the energy remarkably. It kind of, the, it, 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 inclines you toward tranquility and concentration. It, it arouses virya, a nice, balanced, smooth energy. It, it somehow burns off the restlessness. And, um, you know, when we find ourselves in this place where the breath becomes that ambrosial pleasant dwelling you're like wow at the beginning of the retreat i was just breathing now i'm having an ambrosial pleasant dwelling i just found that phrase this week in my study on my on my home retreat i was like oh that is that's a keeper <laughs> the breath as the ambrosial pleasant dwelling so so coming back, you know, to this point, I, I, you know, I when I when I speak in these very detailed ways about the sort of mechanics of practice or the the inner workings of practice, it's ninety percent out of my own experience. You know, 10% is things that I've been taught that have helped me to frame it all. But but most of it is my own experience. So that being said, I have to say, I don't know if it's exactly this way for everybody. But my impression from the teachings that I hear and the comments I hear from students I interact with but mostly from teachings, is that, yeah, it's something like this. It's not going to be unfold exactly the same way, but this kind of interaction of elements, I'm pretty sure this is a, an, a pretty accurate description of, of what happens. And, um, and, and, and again, coming back to the idea of time, the need for sustained practice, it just, there doesn't seem to be a quick way to resolve this, to bring all these elements into balance, to, you know, arouse the energy, to, to release this, the restlessness, to all of that. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, it's one of the things that different teachers who have breakthroughs using particular techniques become attached to, oh, you know, this is the way to do it. And this is the most effective way, but, but I've been around too long, <laughs> you know, and, and you hear enough different teachers make claims over multiple decades and, and you become skeptical that there is one, one path. And, and uh, so I see it in these much more, um, almost generic ways and that that the way to practice the way to to um the actual technique meditative technique that deals with and resolves all these energies uh that can vary you know it can be loving kindness it can be mindfulness of the breath it can be um awareness of, of body sensations it could be a mantra um it could be a prayer. You know, we see descriptions of spiritual breakthroughs, at least I've heard of, uh, mostly through other teachers, uh, spiritual breakthroughs in different traditions, particularly, you know, Christian mystics who encounter the hindrances, but then put them in sort of sin and, uh, uh, you know, prayer mo mode, you know, language. and but uh, But we can sort of translate a lot of what they're saying into the similar terms of the hindrances uh, if we if we take it out of that more religious context 
So, so it seems like there's, you know, a process we have to go through that can be, that can be um, engaged with in, through different techniques. But, but this is why I'm, I don't think technique is the most important thing. You know, I think uh, it, it's helpful to have techniques and, and, um, you know, at different times, different techniques will resonate. And it's very important to stick with, uh, to not just bounce around, like to stick with one technique for a while because restlessness, <laughs> you know, you get like, oh, wait, I'll switch from mindful breathing. Let me do, let me do meta this afternoon. You know, that, maybe that'll deal with this. The meta's not working. Uh, maybe I should do a body scan for a couple hours. Let me try that. And, and what you're doing is you're moving away from the engaging. And so it's, it's a lot like being married <laughs> that, you know, you have to go through, you know, you start, <laughs> these, uh, the challenges because, you know, if you keep switching, you know, when it gets difficult, you just wind up going through the same marriage repeatedly, but never getting to the, you know, past the um, stages of uh, the hindrances. You know, you start with the romantic stage, and then when that wears off, you hit the hindrance stage, and you're like, oh, I need a different partner. Like, you know, I need different meditation techniques, it's the same thing. But, you know, if you if you stick through it, you find, oh, I get to this other place that I, you can only get to if you stick with the same partner or you stick with the same meditation technique for a sustained period. And when I say a sustained period, I mean, like, for a longer retreat or for really for years, <laughs> generally, <laughs> you know, a few years. I don't mean like hundreds of years, but... But if it's good to stick with a particular practice for a few years, uh, I've had kind of different stages of my of my practice. Um, and someone asked me on this last retreat that I taught last weekend, like last last weekend, she was like, well, "What is, what's your practice?" And I think in a way, you know, it's a it's a it's a trap when when we ask our our teachers what their practice is because you know what we're trying to get like oh what's the you know what's the best way because i'm sure they get to do the best thing or whatever and i was pretty vague about it and and i was talking about practicing just with my felt experience but i realized this week while i was on a, my own retreat that my practice now is mindfulness of breathing um but it it's more encompassing than that and and that's the other thing about when we say oh you're working with a particular practice say you're working with loving kindness practice if you're working with loving kindness practice you're also working with mindfulness of breathing mindfulness of the body the felt experience and you're also working with the hindrances and and, and concentration and insight. So, and, you know, if you're working with mindfulness of breathing, you're also working with mindfulness of feelings. Uh, you're working with loving kindness, compassion. You're, you know, you're working with the hindrances. You're, they're all, you know, they all gather all these things together. It's just that you're kind of, you have kind of a primary uh, way in and, and kind of technique that you're using. But but that's why, again, I don't think technique is the most important thing. Uh, so don't get married, says Jonathan. Did I say that? I did not say that. Let's not get into that. There's a whole other take. I'm going to have to char start charging for this class if people want me to talk about marriage. So um, so let me open it up and see uh, what thoughts or questions there are from people today. I feel like I've kind of put out some rich thoughts. At least I'd like to think so. <laughs> they felt rich over here in Berkeley where it is raining. <laughs> so who knows? But uh, yeah. Oh, Mary Helen, hi. And I, I will say just, uh, Mary Helen, because you were on that retreat, that on the this retreat, which was this what the sixteenth to the twentieth, I find my 
my meditation getting very strong several times. And that was what inspired me to like, I'm just going to keep going when I get home. So like I got home on Monday and then on Tuesday, I had to sort things out and do some teaching. And then I started practicing on Wednesday. So I, I really feel like I've been on retreat that whole time, you know, in a, in a way, in a weirdly <laughs> weird way, but go ahead. So I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you um, <laughs> what suggestions you would have <clears throat> for uh, for longer meditation on our on our own, I'm going to have some more time next week. My family's going away, and I I don't think I'm going to spend the whole week meditating. But I <laughs> will have longer periods of time. And so, what what can I? How can I structure that time, or how can I look at that yeah. away? I have never been on a very long retreat. Your mm -hmm. the retreats with you are yeah. the longest and most intensive sitting that I've ever done. Yeah, and and on those retreats with me, it they are long enough to get a good taste of practice, but I, I don't know that they're not long enough to sort of guarantee. There's a at a certain stage, it's almost like you're guaranteed to get to at least a state of samatha, like tranquility. And that's, and but I think it takes seven to 10 days to really kind of guarantee that. Um, anyway, um, you know, I, I don't have any particular big ideas other than whatever your ordinary period of meditation time is, lengthen it, yeah. <laughs> commit to lengthening it. And and typically what happens when we lengthen our practice is we start, much like marriage, we start to encounter the challenging stuff that we might have been avoiding, that ordinary, ordinarily we'd be like, okay, good, I'm done. <laughs> you know, okay, 10 minutes, okay, good, I'm done. And so then that's when we really start to practice in a serious way because if it's easy frankly you're not really getting anywhere i <laughs> just sad to say but it has to be diff you it has to be difficult before it's going to get deeper and so the the best way to make it difficult is to sit for longer periods of time and so i, I would i would say if right now you're sitting once a day, then sit twice a day for a longer period. And, and I think 45 minutes is a good session. You can, you can, 20 minutes, you can definitely avoid dealing with anything. You can, you can fake your way through 20 minutes. My, my experience, you know, 30 minutes, it starts to be like, oh, okay. 45, you kind of have to deal with it. It's like, all right, fine. I'll breathe. Well, so that's, that would be my first kind of suggestion is just like try to get, get it to 45. You know, I've been, I do hour, hour sits on my retreats and it's hard for me generally. And that's, you know, why I do it. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks. Marina, hi. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah, where Good are to you? See everybody. LA. Oh, you LA. are. All right. Yeah, LA. Good. LA. I'm actually not to take this time for all of that, but I was uh, I was on Friday at Big Bear because I'm in the middle of interviewing with them. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And I met Paula. And we have so many people in common that we know, obviously, uh -huh. including you, that uh, it was wonderful. Good. Um, but it, you just, you just reminded me that I haven't done a retreat for a long time. <laughs> so thank you for, for just, uh, nudging <laughs> me a little bit, but, um, I can identify with that, uh, with that, uh, feeling in the body and that sensation you're mentioning, but, but also my, my kind of noticing when I've done retreats in the past is that the more things are going on in my life, the more obviously turbulent the retreat will be. And if there's a lot of going on, especially on the level of uh, relationships, 
uh, then that's going to probably just take uh, take a lot of space uh, mm-hmm. uh, in my mind. And there's a lot of like problem solving as if like, okay, now let's dedicate this this time for problem solving in my life, which is not meant to be dedicated to that at all. But that's where the mind wants to go also. Like, how can I, you know, what am I going to do after I finish with this? Well, why am I, why am I there? Why am I not here doing this <laughs> right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I find it so ridiculous. One of the things I enjoyed about this retreat I just did, because I was home, because often when I go and get on a retreat away, as soon as I get there, I'm like, oh, I want to go home. <laughs> or when when's this going to be over so I can be home? So I was like, I didn't feel any of that. It was actually very nice. But it's it's always really ridiculous. I'm on, I'm like this is the first day of the retreat, and I'm thinking about the end. What is going? You know, it's so mm-hmm. it, the mind is just shameless. You know, it really mm-hmm. is. And uh, you know, you just have to put up with it. But uh, but I think for me, like when I've been on retreat, when there was something difficult in my life, usually there's a way in which. At a certain point, it almost makes it not easier, but it gives me this contrast. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, all that stuff is out there, but it's not here. Mm-hmm. And that makes it even sweeter kind of to be on the retreat and just realize, you know, this is this is the preciousness of stillness and quiet and, and being with the heart and being with community and and being in this timeless environment that has nothing to do with the time that and the world mm-hmm. that's out there. So I, I, in a way, I just remember. I'm just. I don't have specific memories, but I just have sort of a visceral sense of of having had that experience a couple times. Um, yeah, thank you for pointing that out too. I I, I remember I. I, I did my my last kind of on my own retreat last year, about a year ago. I was in Bali and there's a place called Bali Silent Retreat. And they provide a venue where you can also do your own work if you know what to do, obviously, like what practices you have. But mm-hmm. what I've no- noticed that it, there's a specific set and setting to every retreat. Like what's yeah. my intention why I'm doing this, especially right. if there are other practices other than just the Buddhist kind of type of practices, Right. But there is a, when there is distractions, I kind of tend to lose that um, that uh, container, yeah. and it almost for me personally has to be really tight in order for me to be able to just really do what I'm doing because otherwise there's just a lot going on. I think that, I think that's absolutely true, and this is why, you know, the typical vipassana or insight retreat is so tightly structured because mm. it it can kind of fall apart so easily energetically i've had that i had that on a self retreat in 2012 I w- i'd been working on my album and i looked at an email and it was an email from the producer saying something messed up and and it b- completely blew apart the retreat and i was like oh this is why you don't look at email you know um and you know and and the you know the thing is that on a long retreat like a month long or longer it doesn't even have to be anything external it can be internal it can just be a memory or a thought that sends you down a rabbit hole and mm-hmm. and you're just like lost and they call it yogi mind you know where you get completely lost in and you, and you've lost touch with the re, with your practice, and you're like for hours on end, you can be just like wandering around and sitting there, but like you're just just crazy. Uh, it happened to me on a retreat at Spirit Rock, where I think it was a two week retreat, but this young man got up during the Q and A in the morning uh, and started yelling at Jack Cornfield in the meditation hall. And there were a hundred people in the hall for this silent retreat. We'd been there for whatever, a week or two. And, and he was obviously having some kind of a, you know, psychotic episode. And I started to uh, 
obsessed that he was going to go get an automatic weapon and come back and kill everybody. That just made that up. There was no basis for it, you know, but I spent hours in my room, just like obsessing on this. And, and I had before that had been completely concentrated and focused and it was just, it was crazy. And, and I actually had an interview with Jack the next day and he said, why didn't you come and find a teacher? I was like, I, that didn't occur to me. Like, I, I kind of felt like, well, I have to deal with this. Is my, oh my God. There's what, uh, it was just, it was just a classic yogi mind where you just get obsessed with some bizarre idea. Um, and so, uh, and, and I've come, I've concluded, uh, this is one of Kevin's, you know, conclusions, which take it for what you will that what is happening in that moment is that your concentration is very deep. And this is why it happens on a retreat. Your concentration is very deep, but you get wrong mindfulness. So it's, it, or you could call it wrong concentration. So you're, you're concentrating on the wrong thing, but because the concentration is very strong, it's very hard to break out of it. You know, that's why you get caught in it. And I think that's why people have these kind of, psychotic breaks on retreats <laughs> mm. uh, you know that that uh the concentration gets focused on the wrong thing and uh and because it's so strong it's hard to break so that's the thing to be really careful of and and really and jack was exactly right the most important thing at that moment is run don't walk <laughs> to the closest teacher to to and to talk to them and and get out of your head really as much as you can you know if you ever have anything like that on a retreat immediately find a teacher or a or a staff member to talk to and talking is the best uh, antidote and the first antidote to that thank don't you. know thanks for sharing don't know why i had to go there but there you go uh any other uh Thoughts or comments this morning? I see people have been sort of drifting away. It's the terrible thing about Zoom that you're you're watching the numbers. I'm like, you know, if you're if you're a marketing executive, you're like, okay, what was it that I said that then people started to leave? <laughs> Don't say that anymore. <laughs> it's, of course, it could be that they just have to go to work. You know, it might not be about me. What? Uh, Holly, hello. Uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, oh, you've got to go. Yeah. So, so I'm going to turn the recording off. Okay. That's good. Nobody needs to hear this. Oh, that, okay. I mean, they, they've heard enough of me. Let me say goodbye okay. recording people. Hello, right. Polly. <laughs>